All right, we're ready for Genesis chapter 13. Good to see you. Saw a bumper sticker on a on a uh, retired person's car. It says, I'm speeding because I have to get there before I forget where I'm going. So, I don't know, you know. That's uh, I found out, too, yesterday at 4 o'clock, if you figure out you got a nail in your tire, you can forget going anywhere around here and getting out. They can't work you in. You know, that's the favorite saying. One guy did say, I mean, he said, he said, you'd have to leave it all day. Okay. I said, well, it's attached to the car, so I don't think that's going to happen. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I want the car to move. <laughs> Oh, man. Genesis 13. We've started with Abram. Promise was made. Of course, we haven't we haven't gotten him to Abraham yet. We've got him. Where he's at Abram. He will be Abraham before long. But he's Abram, and we'll call him that just so we don't get confused. But Abram uh, has been given promise by God. Get up, go away. I'm gonna give you. That's kind of in a nutshell. It's, but in chapter 13, we, we learn a lot of things. We, we're going to learn a little bit more about Abram. We're going to learn about um, how to keep peace uh, amongst yourselves and how to make good choices. And so let's let's get on with it, if you don't mind. Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich, and we saw that last week, rich in livestock and silver and gold. Can you imagine now? having all of that, and traveling. They didn't have the Bank of Jerusalem, right? They didn't have that yet. So what wealth he had, he had to carry with him. So, okay, we're fixing to move. Pack all this up. And so he did. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel <coughs> to the place where, he, where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Once again, while he goes back, he goes back to where he had been. He goes back, but he worships God. And that's one of the things that we talked about last week. That was one of the great characteristics of Abram, is that wherever he went, wherever he pitched his tent, he made an altar and he worshiped God. He thanked God for different things or worshiped God in different way in, in the way God wanted him to, but worshiped with different uh, philosophies or different points, different uh, thoughts in mind, I'm sure at the time. And so he goes back and he worships God again. What a great reminder it is for us. And you know, that's one of the things I think we're going to see come out of the pandemic that is going to be sad in a way, yet, uh, maybe not. Maybe not, but uh, usually when you, you, you go out to vacation or visiting somewhere, you usually duck into a local congregation somewhere, and you see and meet the brethren there. And, and uh, with the pandemic and all of us doing uh, our searches online some way, uh, folks are probably going to quit ducking in when they go out on vacation. And so uh, it's understandable, but... It's uh, going to be a sad thing in some ways, and so that's kind of one of the bad things that may come out of the pandemic, and who knows. But Abram always stopped and he worshiped God. Lot also well, was with Abram in verse 5, and he also had flocks and herds and tents, and land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. So they had a lot of wealth, a lot of livestock. And the the ground the the was arid was uh, or the air the the climate was arid and the the land doesn't produce a lot of vegetation for herds and so you know if you have very many and then you have a partner that has a whole lot as well you just don't have the 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 quality of goods that you need to to keep up your livestock and so that was the case here and there was strife verse seven between the herdsmen of Abraham's or Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of live, Lot's livestock, the Canaanites and the Prezites then dwelt in the land. You know, that's sad, isn't it? It's sad that they got together 
they had been together for a while. We looked at it last week. But it's sad that they they couldn't get along. The workers, uh, Lot's workers and Abram's workers couldn't get along for whatever reason. And we don't know. Uh, you might say, well, it's because the, the land was so arid, it didn't produce enough. And, and so therefore they were fighting for the same uh, property, si- fighting for the same feed, if you will, fighting for the same water. <clears throat> I got you. I mean, I don't know. That could be the reason. But it, it, it's just kind of sad. I, I kind of, I was just, I write notes and then uh, as I'm reading and then I'll go back and study people and write more notes. And But I, I wrote a note for myself and just asked the question, why can't we all get along? Well, we find out a little bit about it beginning in verse 8. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brethren. It is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. Now, I want you to think about how Abram solved this problem. Here's a problem. And here's a, here's a good way of solving problems between folks, whether it's in the church or out of the church, whether it's a, a neighbor next door or it's a, it's a neighbor that lives you know, several doors down, or it's a member of the church. There, we, we're going to have conflict with people. Why? Well, we see things differently. We, we look through, we all look through lenses or prisms or whatever you want to call it, but we all look through different ones. We have different ways of approaching things. And uh, I have a new neighbor. Come to find out this is actually their second home. Uh, they still live in... in uh, Oklahoma, and so they're they're back and forth. And I met her Friday, and you know why I met her? She needs somebody to cut her yard. I didn't volunteer because they have let it get that high, and so I didn't volunteer. And it's a big yard, uh, but I called Steve and said, "Hey, who's the church service? What service do we use for the church?" And I'm gonna let them know about that, and so we did. And uh, but she came over. She came through the back gate, which was absolutely fine. She came on the property while I was mowing, and I hope to get along with her and her husband. And uh, you might be praying for them. Uh, he's uh, he's got some issues, and uh, so uh, let's pray for those folks uh, that they'll get settled soon, and that uh, who knows, maybe we can make inroads with them. But seem to be nice people because then I went through the back gate to their house and told her I went through the back gate, and she said, that's fine. That's what it's there for. Well, that's neighborly. I hope it's always that way. I have had one or two neighbors that weren't neighborly, haven't you? Oh, yeah, we all have. Abram and Lot, their herdsmen working together, couldn't work together. And so Abram, though, saw that there was a problem. And not only saw that there was a problem, but then he went out and he said, okay, Let's don't have strife. So he sounds a plea. Let, let's, let's iron this thing out. Let's figure out what the issue is. Let's, let's see what we can do to resolve the problem. And so, so you see a problem. You sound out a plea to the problem. And then notice what happens in verse 9. He sets a plan in action. Okay. Why you pick? And that's sort of magnanimous, if you will, of Abram, isn't it? To say, okay, they'll let you choose. Because we might say, you know, now this looks better than that over there. I, hey, I, why don't I just go over here and you just go over there? But that's, that's not the way Abram decided to make peace. He says, you pick which way you want to go, and I'm going to go the opposite. And so there's a plan that's put in place. But notice, I want you to think for a minute about the plea. The plea was, look, we don't need to to fight because we're brethren. They were, from a standpoint of of kinsmen, first of all, and nationality, they, they were brethren. We need to all get along. And so that was the thought. Anything anybody would like to say about that? Very true. Very true, especially as we as we see the next verse. <laughs> Very true. And uh, th- that's uh, 
but but also notice the fact that there were there was a problem that probably precipitated another problem. The problem was that their possessions were great and they couldn't dwell together. Why? Because verse 6 says the land was not able to support them. That was the problem. That probably produced another problem amongst the herdsmen. And basically the best thing that they could do was to, to go separate ways. Probably didn't like that idea, but that was just the best way and best thing that they could do. Lot then, verse 10, we do find a little bit into to Lot's personality. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. The men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Here's my note that I wrote beside this the other day when I was just casually reading. All that glitters is not gold. We look... And you think about what Lot did. What did Lot do? Lot lifted up his eyes. He looked. He said, man, this looks good. This looks so-so. Jordan looks good. It looks well watered. It looks like it it could support me. It looks like it could support everything. And he said, that's where I want to get. And so that's where he went. But as he got into the land, he ended up as far as Sodom. And yet, what does the text say? Well, it says... Sodom was exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. What looked good was in reality not good. And we know, and that we can say that because I'm not spoiling the story, because we probably all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, as we'll see that story unfold here for too long. But it reminds us of an idea or of a thought that is this, how and what directs your life? What seemed to direct Lot's life, at least by what Moses gives us in the first part of of this text, is this looks good. But he didn't stop to think about the consequences. Now, sometimes we can't foresee consequences as they come out. In other words, sometimes we can see things and we can see clearly the future. And sure enough, those things happen. But sometimes there are consequences and sometimes there are unintended consequences that come that we just really could not see. Maybe he really could not see the problems that would come out of Sodom. Maybe he didn't know Sodom was exceedingly wicked. Maybe he knew and he thought, I can handle this. My family can handle this. My herdsmen can handle this. You see, some of those things are not recorded for us, so we don't know. And we can only speculate, and to be honest, speculation is not really good or safe, because why? We can speculate one way, and it could have been exactly the opposite. We don't know, unless it's revealed to us, we don't really know what's in the minds and the hearts of individuals. God does. But we don't. We think we do. But we don't always. Lot, though, chooses to go. And notice what it says then, beginning in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes, lift your eyes. Look, look, look now. And look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you, your descendants forever. God says, here's the promise. Here's the land. Here's the land that I promised to you. Here's the land. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to your descendants or to those after you. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also could be numbered. 
Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And Abram moved his tent, went and dwelt by the ter- <clears throat> excuse me, terebinth tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And guess what he did? He built an altar. He worshipped God. So God had promised, get up and I'll take you to a land. So now God says, here it is. It's yours. Promise made, promise fulfilled. That's important. Anything anybody like to say or add? Yes. Yes. Sodom. Yeah. Right. Then you see him coming out of Sodom. <laughs> very, very much changed. Yes. Very true. Excellent point. Anything else? Well, let me give you also a thought here out of this chapter, and that is make good choices. Make good choices in life. Like I say, sometimes we make choices in life that we think are good, and there are consequences, and there are unintended consequences, and sometimes there are things that uh, we just could not factor in because they were other people. They were beyond our control. But nevertheless, when we make choices, we need to make good choices. Those choices need to have solid foundations. Make choices and be sure that choices, the choices you make will affect you. And so be careful because as we said with regards to Lot's choice, all that glitters is not gold. Looks good. Sounds good. That's sort of like um, last night I was watching something and a commercial came up and it told you how it was going to get rid of all your cords for your laptop your tablet, your telephone, and get rid of all those cords. And when they got through, I told Suzanne, I said, it won't work. She said, why? I said, because it's a power source that plugs into the to the wall. And then it can be unplugged and used as a battery power source, backup. But guess what you still need? All the cords. Because you got to hook the, the tablet, the laptop, or whatever, with your cord. It even said that in the in the advertisement to this power source. So the advertisement, those people need to think of how they're packaging their product. Unfortunately, bad. Yeah, well, yeah, because, uh, you know, and I really like Lisa Robinson, you know, but uh, I really like her. She used to be on QVC. She comes on deals and whatever, Channel 4, the news. Um, like her, she's a good old Tennessee girl, but nah, nah, it's, you know, if you want it, I don't see anything wrong with it, but it's not going to do exactly what they tell you. It's going to do some things, but not exactly. Got to be careful. Be careful what you buy. Anything else? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's the, yeah, yeah. Anything else? All right, well, let's go on to to chapter 14. We find Lot is captive and he's rescued. This uh, This has been by some touted as the first war in the Bible. And that's correct that's from, from the standpoint of the Bible. First war in the Bible. It's really how God works out his salvation, if you will. Let's just look at it, not with regards to eternal salvation, but saving of, of some. It came to pass in the days of, now I may mispronounce some of these folks, and if you know how to pronounce them, I'm all for you doing it. Amraphel, uh, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, uh, Shatter Lamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. And they made war, get that, with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, 
Shinab, king of Adma, uh, Shemember, Shemember, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is Salt City, as we would think of it. Twelve years they served Shalimar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. So for twelve years, thirteen years you might say, there are five city states in the plain of Jordan that are subject to the kings of four eastern city states. But they finally revolt. What happens? Well, let's look. In the fourteenth year of Shalimar, the kings that were with him came and attacked Raphim and Ashtaroth and Kara. Uh, Karna, Karnaim and Zumum and Ham and Eman in Sheva uh, and the Horites in their mountains of Seir as far as El Paran which is by the wilderness when they turned back and came in in Mishfat that is Kadesh and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazan, Hazaz, Hazazan Tamar. In other words, you have fight. You have folks that have been subservient for 13 years. They decide, no, we're not taking this anymore. We're not being loyal subjects to you. We're not being uh, individuals that uh, give our money to you. We're tired of it. And it says then that there is this revolt. In verse 8, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, joined together in the battle in the valley of Siddim against Shadalmar, king of Elam, title king of nations, Ephrael, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisor, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Now, here's what you need to see. You have this, you have especially Sodom and Gomorrah that are rising against Shalimar. It says that they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. So you have a taking away. Then one escaped, came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terabith trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshel, brother of Anar, or Anar, some say, and they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house. And they went in pursuit as far as Dan. So Abram hears that uh, Lot has been taken captive. Lot has been taken away. And so in hearing that, Abram gets those folks that basically he's had all their life and he's trained them. He's, he has explained to them. He has shown them. He has trained them how to, to, to go about their business. And verse 15 says, he divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot, his goods, as well as the women of the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Shalimar, the kings who were with him. And so you have Abram leading, helped to lead, the delivering, if you will, of Lot, and notice what it says, that he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot, his goods. And so Abram and his men won the battle. Now, where do we, where, what do we get out of this? Well, we get basically the, if you will, blood's thicker than water sometimes. <laughs> family, family protects family, how important that is. And so Abram, when he heard, he goes out. And remember, go back to what we just talked about in chapter 13. Lot and Abram divided. Now, 
I don't know about you, but when I read the, the 13th chapter, I don't necessarily get a sense that there was a problem between Lot and Abram as much as there were between the fact of their herdsmen and also the fact that the land could not support them. Maybe there was. But think about it. They divided. And think about how the Abram probably sat while the plains in which Abram went were blessed and God said, look at all this. It's all yours and it's all your descendants. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. Abram goes to his rescue. Let's see what we can do. And so he is able to deliver him. He's able to bring him back. And then verse 18, we find a man by the name of Melchizedek. Now, I'm going to get real hot and heavy into Melchizedek just for the simple reason that when we studied the book of Hebrews, we tried to figure out who Melchizedek was. And so we're just going to kind of look at this text here. Uh, since it's somewhat repetitive of what we studied just recently on Wednesday night. But let's look at see what it says. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest, God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. I, I want you to not get caught up into exactly who Melchizedek is, but I do want you to get caught up in what he says. Look at look at how he he is thankful to the Lord and how he he gives the Lord credit. Blessed be God of or blessed be Abram, God of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God Most High, who's delivered your enemies in your hand. Strange question. In your life, what do you give God credit for? Everything? Hopefully. Usually, though, usually, what do we do? We blame him for what's bad, and we, we're so thankful for what we did that's good, right? Uh, you know, we try not to. I'm not saying we do. We try not to. But so many times, that's what we do, you know. Oh, yeah, I did that. I built that. I fixed that. I changed that. I moved that. Well, you might say, well, we understand, you know, yes, God gave us the strength. God gave us the talents. God gave us the insight. God gave us the technology. do da do da do da And so we use the I kind of what's called accommodatively. But yet in our own personal life, what do we do? Do we sit back when we finish a project? Thank you, God. Thank you for the talents. Thank you for what I have. Thank you for... Hopefully we do. I'm not saying we don't. Hopefully we do. This is sort of at least the thought I get out of this. Now, Kesedek says, great stuff. God's great. God has given you... And he gave him a tithe. The tenth. That was common in Old Testament. He gave him a tenth of all... The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. So there's sort of a, a, a division there that the king of Sodom wants. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a, a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that's yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young man men have eaten and the portion of men who went with me, and our Eshkol and Mamre, let them take their portion. In other words, Abram says, I'm not taking anything. Sodom, the king of Sodom says, you know, you, you take you take over here, you I'll give you the persons and take the goods to yourselves. Give me or excuse me, give me the persons. Well, you look at that and you say, well, you know, that sounds like a good proposition because basically what the king's saying, hey, I just want the people. And you can have. Now, 
you know, that, that just sounds good when you think about it off the top of your head. Okay, well, I'm getting, getting something out of this. Uh, if you're Abram, you say, well, I'm getting something out of this. This is what I'm gaining, and I'm gaining something. I'm not gaining people, but I am getting possession. But Abram says, no, 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 not working that way. Because I don't want you saying that you made me rich. First of all, why? Well, in part, Abraham was already rich, wasn't he? Second of all, think about it. He didn't want the king of Sodom to, in essence, have an upper hand over him and God. You didn't have anything to do with this. And so, no, we're not, that's not the way it's going to take place. He says, but, he says, now what you did give to eat to the folks that came with me, you, you can't take that back. And you can't take food back. You can't take food back. You might try, but you can't do it. He says, except what they've eaten. And then he says, there are men that came with me and are Ashkel and Amory. He says, you give them their portion. You let them have what uh, is theirs. And so Sodom now becomes a power. And we will get back to them with regards to the text we'll a little later on. But you need to understand that for a while Sodom was oppressed. Gomorrah, they were oppressed. They rose up in revolt. And then, really, with the help of they were freed from the king under which they had been subservient to and became, in essence, their own power. Now, that's that's a historical part that when you read this book of Genesis, that, you know, we're always looking for the spiritual lesson, and I, and that's correct. That's what we should do. We should always look for the spiritual lesson. But understand, this is trying to get you into the historical aspect so that when we later on, when Lot is leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, we understand a little bit more about maybe why Lot's wife looked back. Okay? And we'll talk about that when we get there. But anything else? All right. Well, good. I'm about to catch up with where I wanted to catch up with. That's good. I try to teach these lessons in a way that we try to catch everything, but at the same time, too, I don't I don't want to be in Genesis forever. I, 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 I know of a guy, and I checked on him the other day, his uh, videos. His, he started two years ago preaching on Sunday night out of the book of Psalms. He's still there. I know, because I know the brethren there, they're weary, not of studying the Bible, but of studying Psalms. Psalms is a great, great book, and I like to go run in it, do it for a little while, and then run back out, and then run back in, do a little bit more out of Psalms, and run back out. This old boy's been doing it for two years, and uh, he's wearied the brethren with it. So I try not to weary you with, with a book. We try to catch everything, move on, and we can always come back later. So, But if I get going too fast, tell me, and if I get going too slow, tell me, and we'll do, we'll do whatever we need to do. But let's go to the 15th chapter unless somebody's got something. After these things, what things? Well, probably the things of chapter 14, chapter 13 and 14. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Let that just set in for a minute. Isn't that a great thought? Here came the word of the Lord to Abram, and he says, Do not be afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of what he's hearing right now, that vision, probably so. But do not fear what's about to happen. Don't fear. Move forward with great confidence. How's he going to be able to do that? Well, He's going to do that because, as we'll see in just a minute, there there's going to be a covenant that's made between God and Abram. But he says, I'm your shield. Now, 
when you think about a shield, you think about different shields. Now, by Roman times, the shield's a little bit different than what it was in Old Testament times. By by New Testament times, you had really about three different types of shields. You had, first of all, you had a round shield that looks sort of like a, the lid off of a, of a metal trash can. Then you had a little bit bigger shield that would cover a little bit more of you, but you could still handle. And then you had shields that basically went from the ground to about face high that you could really hide behind. And that was by New Testament times. By Old, in Old Testament times, we're not 100% sure of, of their shields, here, God is saying, I'm your shield, I'm your protection. That's what a shield does. A shield protects. A shield is not an offensive weapon, it is a defensive weapon. It is that which is used to knock off the blows, whether it's a small a little shield that is able to, to be used and maneuvered to, to block the blows, or it's a big shield that you can hide behind. God says, I'm your shield. I am your defensive weapon. You're exceeding great reward. So he, he tells him, basically, there's another way, the, the New King James has a footnote, it says, or it could be said, your reward shall be very great. And that may be what the Hebrew is trying to say. God is saying, I'm going to reward you, just as he promised. Go back to chapter 12 and remember that promise, then remember the promise that he made in the 13th chapter. Now here we somewhat see it again, the 15th chapter. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham, Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Abram asked a very intelligent question when you stop and think about it. God had promised what with regards to the nations? All the nations of the earth would be blessed. He'd also promised what? That his seed would be as what? As the sands. And yet he's sitting back and saying, I'm getting old, and I don't have anybody. There's only one person. It's a servant, servant that was born in my house, Eliezer. That's the only one that I can really claim as an heir. So, God, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? That is an interesting question to ask. We say it's an intelligent question. I think that it is. But I want you to think with me for just a minute. Go off into a, another circle another thought for just a minute how many times in our life we absolutely believe and trust in the promises of god that god will take care of us and all things will work together for good and we're going through a difficult difficult time and we basically say god what when and how are you going to provide to get me out to get me through to get me past. I've been there. I'll tell you, I've been there. It's not that I doubted God, didn't doubt him in the least. I wondered about his timetable. I wondered how he was going to get it all done. I'm a guy that likes to sit down and look back instead of looking forward. That's the question that Abram is asking. But look at the answer. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Now, you could claim a, 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 a master, if you will, if you let me use those terms. A master could, could claim a servant as his own. But Abram says, oh, One that comes from your own body. True heir, as we would think of an heir. Uh, he says, This is going to be who's going to come and says, then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so to, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So here's another promise made again. You're going to have innumerable descendants. 
And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted to him for righteousness. So Abram believed in the Lord, and thus God credited it to him for his righteousness. Abram says, okay. He might, he might have sat there and scratched his head and said, I don't know how all this is going to work out. But Abram went forward. He counted it for righteousness. And then he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? See, this is a logical discussion that we have sometimes in our own mind and maybe in our own prayer life with God when things are going on in our life. We understand. We've got it. We trust God. We believe God. But when's all this going to happen? How's it going to happen? And so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, these were items that were often used, especially if you get in and look at it uh, from the standpoint of Leviticus. These were, were items that were used in a covenant ceremony, an agreement between two sides. So let's see what happens. He brought all these to him, and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Why didn't he cut the birds in two? I don't know. Small anyway, right? And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Vultures will attack anything. And so buzzards came, and Abram drove them away. And the sun was going down, and deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, a horror and great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. What's that? That's a prophecy, yeah, I think, with regards to Egyptian bondage. And also the nations whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you should be buried in, at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they will, shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So it, it, he's telling them, you're going to die. And yet your people are going to come back. They're going to be gone for a while, but then they're going to come back. And they're going to come back to this land. And uh, he says, all this is going to happen. This is... Uh, I, like I say, a prophecy, for lack of a better term, a foretelling of what is yet to happen, what will be. Abram is getting some insight into what's going to happen to his people, what's going to happen to his descendants. Now, we all have general insights, general, vague insights into the future, right? If, if the Lord allows the land to stand. If this happens, if that and it's all you know, it's all conditional. But think if God were to speak to you as he spoke to Abraham and say, Okay, this is the way it's gonna be. Now you might not know every detail, but he knows a lot. And he knows what's going to happen to his people because God has told him. But I want you to to kind of center in on the the thought, I don't know why, it just it just kind of hits me as interesting. He says, you're going to live to a good old age. What a great promise. You know, as long as I have health, I, I'd like to live a long time. Suzanne was looking at something yesterday, or not yesterday, the other night, and she said the, the age for uh, folks with cystic fibrosis, which is what our granddaughter has, the uh, life expectancy has moved from something like 20 to 50 in like the last just a little bit. And that's, um, that's comforting to us. It's, a, it's an assurance. It tells you how far science has come. And as I told Suzanne, I said, well, it's something, but that means that folks have lived uh, longer than 50 to get the age up to 50. And I said, that's a, I said I'll just about outlive her. And my wife laughed. Does she think 50 more years, how old would I be? 
a lot. <laughs> and so I was kidding, of course. But, uh, you know, Abram was promised to live a good old age. Uh, right quickly, it came to pass, the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a burning torch that passed between these pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Prezites, the Rephim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gigashites, and the Jebusites. And so this was a, a promise, basically, uh, that God gave for the people moving forward. Anything else? George keeps ringing that bell. I can't figure out why. Uh huh. That's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that is a good point. Hmm. I have to think about that in this week. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to live with them. Yeah. Sometimes you don't want to live with them, right? <laughs> Uh, let's bow right quick for a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the blessing of it. We're thankful that you love us, that you watch over us, that you take care of us. We ask that you be with those that are sick and those that will be announced in a few minutes. Our announcements, watch over them, bless them, and keep them. We're thankful for this study of Abram, for what it means for us and what, how it impacts our lives. We ask that you watch over us now, bless us, and keep us. And hold us as we hold to you, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all.